to the small cathedral city of Wells, but this is Wells Methodist Church. As we come to worship God, he holds us in love. He holds us in peace and in joy. So we praise him as we sing together our first hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. to a time of prayer, let us pray. God of all space and time, God of stable, fishing boat, marketplace and cross, show yourself in today's world as God of factory and farm, of stock exchange and coffee shop, of university and refugee camp, as well as of our own hearts and homes. May all our journeys be pilgrimages, and when we reach a goal, may it be the starting point of positive change and another way of life. Lord our God, help us to give our minds to you in our worship, so that we may listen, really listen, to what you have to say to us, and know your will. Help us to give our hearts to you in our worship so that we may really want to do what you require of us. Help us to give our strength to you in our worship so that through us your will may be done. O God, we thank you for this earth for the wide sky and the blessed sun, for the salt sea and the running water, for the everlasting hills and the never-resting winds, for trees and the common grass underfoot. Grant us heart wide open to all this beauty, O God, our Creator, who lives and reigns 
forever and ever. And a prayer of confession. Lord, we are aware of our shortcomings. And in a moment of silence, we bring to you the times this past week when we regret our thoughts and our actions. O oh God, our Father, direct and control every part of our life, our tongues that we speak no false words, our actions that we do nothing to shame ourselves or hurt others, our minds that we think no evil or bitter thoughts, our hearts that they may be set only on pleasing you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we join together in the version of the Lord's Prayer, which is generally used in this church. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Summer is here. And our thoughts possibly turn towards holidays, which of necessity usually involve a journey. So if you're going on a journey, what would you take with you? I suppose it depends where you're going, for how long and what sort of holiday it is. For instance, you would need different things for climbing mountains or being by the sea, or visiting relatives. But in general, you would need clothes, toiletries, credit card and money, your passport and tickets, your phone, of course, something to read or do. And if you're a certain age, you make sure you have an adequate supply of medication. A journey usually has a definite end. You know where you're going and a reason for doing it. You usually have plans for its execution. A pilgrimage is a different sort of journey, usually to a shrine or other holy place. So there is a spiritual element. <laughs> And there's the journey of life, which we all take. When I looked in the dictionary, as is my custom, I was interested to note that the definition of pilgr pilgrimage was the journey of life. Food for thought there, that this too, our journey of life, has a spiritual element. Recently, I saw the film called The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. He went on a journey, but as the title suggests, a most unlikely one. One morning at his home in South Devon, he receives a letter from a former colleague with whom he'd worked many years before informing him that she was now in a hospice in Berwick-on-Tweed and not expected to live very long. He replies by letter, but as he posts it, on impulse he decides he'll visit her and that somehow she will not die until he arrives. So he sets off there and then to walk the 500-odd miles from South Devon to Berwick-on-Tweed, 
no proper plan, no luggage, just what he's wearing. An unlikely scenario indeed. It transpires that he does have a credit card and some money, and we'll think more about this later. But for now, we will hear from the Word of God about a journey. I'm reading from Genesis 12, 1 to 9. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarah, and his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued towards the Negev. Thanks be to God. And now we sing a hymn about travelling singing the faith 476 one more step along the world i go one more step along the world Of the world, like sun, 
reading comes from Luke 9, verses 1 to 6. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If the people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Thanks be to God. Contrast the journey of Abram with the fictional story of Harold Fry that I mentioned. Harold's journey was in answer to a letter. Abram's, a call from God. Harold's was spontaneous, spur of the moment. Abram's was actually split into two parts. You may have noticed that the reading began, the Lord had told Abram to leave his country. And apparently he hadn't done that, so this was a second call. Harold went on his journey with no encumbrances. Abram, we are told, took all his possessions. Harold had no conditions or promises about his journey. Abram was promised that he would be a great nation and a blessing to all peoples. Harold was alone most of the time. Abram had his family, his wife, his nephew, all his animals, all his servants. In Harold's story, there was no apparent faith in God. Abram definitely had faith in God because we are told twice that he built altars to God on his journey. But there we'll leave the fictional Harold Fry and concentrate on Abram, whose name means exalted father. Later this was changed to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. And we'll see what we can glean from this passage of scripture, what it might mean for us in our day. The passage is entitled The Call of Abram and describes the covenant God made with him. The promises God made were that Abram's line would be a great nation. Abram's name would be great. He would be blessed by God. And through him, other peoples, the Bible says all peoples on earth, would also be blessed. You could say he was blessed to be a blessing. I like that phrase, blessed to be a blessing. But in order for all this to happen, Abram was required to leave his current residence, his country, everything that he knew and loved, and where he felt secure, and go he knew not where. He had to journey in faith, moving into the unknown, but believing that God was with him at all times. I wonder, do you think that any of these promises have come true? Indeed they have. Abraham is the founder of the Jewish nation, revered and respected to this day as the honoured patriarch of the Jews. Through Abraham's line, in due course came Jesus, through whom all peoples are blessed. 
So Abraham was indeed blessed to be a blessing. Running like a golden thread throughout the whole long story of Abraham is his faith in God's promises. There were incidents in his life of error and weakness, but his faith never wavered. Twice in the short passage, we read that at each place he stopped, he built an altar. Although altars were used in many religions at the time, for God's people, they had special significance. They were used for sacrifice, symbolizing communion with God, and commemorated encounters with him, and often lasted for many years as reminders of God's promises and protection. Building altars probably reminded Abraham of God's promises and helped to keep God at the center of his life. So too for us, regular worship, helps to remind us of God's ways and motivates us to follow Jesus' example. The instructions in Luke's Gospel of Jesus to the Twelve were pretty explicit. No stick, no bread, no money. By travelling light, they could travel quickly and with no material items, they had to depend on God's power and provision for them. At that time, it would also show them that the Messiah had not come to offer wealth to his followers. A staff, a bag, a coat were recognisable uniform, as it were, of many wandering philosophers who would accept reward in return for their wisdom. Jesus' good news via the apostles was to be given freely. Earlier we touched on pilgrimage as a journey to a shrine or holy place. Many people have undertaken the long walk to Santiago Compostela. There have been TV programs about it and other such pilgrimages, often over the Easter period. And near to us is the town of Glastonbury, which you could say is a place of pilgrimage with its ancient ruined abbey and the little church on the tour. Recently, here in Wells, we hosted a group of people following the Tollpuddle Martyrs pilgrimage, walking from the New Room in Bristol to the village of Tollpuddle in Dorset, visiting several Methodist chapels on the way. Those martyrs, some of them Methodists, were six agricultural workers in the early 18th century who dared to challenge their employers in relation to a living wage. This action is looked upon now as the beginning of one of the first trades unions, but it earned seven years transportation for those men. But they have been remembered over the centuries since it happened. So, journeys. We thought a little about Abraham's long journey and his complete faith in God. We've smiled at the unlikely pilgrimage of Harold Fry. We've puzzled over Jesus' instructions to his disciples as they journeyed from village to village with the good news of the gospel. We've touched on accounts of pilgrimage. But what of the pilgrimage of our life, our journey from birth to death? What of this day's service will stay with us to help us on that journey? Perhaps thinking about Abraham's faith 
may reinforce our own. Maybe Jesus' instructions to his disciples will help us to depend more on God and hold the things of this world lightly. If we can't actually go on pilgrimage, we can still visit holy places, especially our own church, wherever that may be, week by week. So as we continue on life's journey, may it be in the full knowledge that God is with us every step of the way. And may the spoken word and the written word lead us to the living word this day and always. Amen. Carrying on the theme of journeys, we bring to God the needs of the world. Let us pray. Our Father God, we are constantly shocked at the news we see daily on our TV screens and in our newspapers. So now we think of victims of war, famine and drought, people displaced from their homes, existing in refugee camps. We bring to you items of head, that were headline news a week or two ago, but now quickly back in the realms of the ordinary. And we pray for the people who have been impacted by those headlines. We who are so privileged to have running water in our homes Pray for people, usually women, who have to walk many miles each day to obtain enough water for their family's needs. And we commend agencies like WaterAid. We think of the worldwide church and how the gospel has been spread to all lands over the centuries. We pray for mission partners who, like Abraham, leave home and country to work in far-flung places. In our local community, we imagine in our mind's eye those people we pass each day without really thinking about them. So we pray for long-distance lorry drivers away from their homes for days to bring fresh produce to supermarkets so that we might have food on our tables. And we pray for bus drivers and train drivers, cabs and taxi drivers. And we commend to you people we know who are on holiday at this time. May they find refreshment and renewal, new experiences of delight, new memories made. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves that this time of worship may be for us a time of refreshment and renewal. Continue with us through this journey of life, loving God. Accept all the prayers offered, both spoken and unspoken, because we bring them all through the name of Jesus. Amen. And we sing our final hymn, We Are Marching in the Light of God. Marching, we are marching, marching, we are marching, marching, we are 
As we follow you step by step, loving God, hold us in your peace. Though the way ahead seems uncertain, hold us in your care. As you lead us on, hold us in your joy. For Jesus' sake, amen. <laughs>